Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm, uh, my name is uh, Daniel Vargas, and I am a professor of North American history at Leiden University. Um, and I'm also the director of uh, the Roosevelt Institute for American Studies, uh, the RIAS. And for, for those of you who are joining us from outside of the RIAS or the American Studies community uh, in the Netherlands, um, the RIAS is, is a, a research institute and an archive um, and a graduate school affiliated with Leiden University. And we organize conferences and events that deal with all kinds of aspects of US history, uh, American studies, transatlantic relations. Um, but we also sort of have a public role in the province of Zeeland, where the RIAS is located. Um, so each year we host public lectures, webinars, uh, workshops that are specifically aimed at stimulating public discourse on issues that affect both American and Dutch society, issues that affect all of us from both sides of the pond, uh, things like from the strange state of transatlantic relations at the moment, to refugee migration, racism, the legacy of slavery and colonialism, all kinds of topics. And for all of these public events, we enthusiastically reach out to uh, all kinds of experts, uh, not just the public, but uh, scholars and experts from various disciplines, various backgrounds. And the idea is to, to bring together kind of a motley crew uh, of the public uh, uh, and scholars to, to analyze our most pressing societal challenges from you know, as many angles uh, as possible. It almost goes without saying that issues related to the environment are among the most pressing uh, to our communities in America and the Netherlands um, in our generation. And it's against this backdrop that the RIAS has decided uh, recently to develop a new research profile in um, uh, environmental history and environmental studies. Uh, which is a subfield that is gaining increasing momentum in American studies in general, including here in the Netherlands. Uh, so we have organized uh, lectures and public symposia uh, on themes related to environmental history during the past few years, uh, past two years, and we intend to um, further expand and develop these activities uh, in the years to come. So in, especially starting in January when, um, when we'll be joined by a new postdoc at the RIAS, uh, who is also logged in here, Gaetano Di Tommaso, uh, who is also an environmental historian himself. Today's lecture, uh, a public lecture that we call the Roosevelt Lectures, uh, is very much a part of this commitment of the RIAS to, to help put uh, research related to environmental history uh, on the agenda. And so it's my, my pleasure to, to, to welcome uh, Megan Black uh, from MIT in Boston, uh, who is going to enlighten us uh, with, uh, with a lecture uh, uh, about the environment and global American studies. Uh, before Megan takes the floor, uh, I just want to thank the NASA for uh, for organizing uh, this event uh, together with us. Um, and I'll I'll give the word first to uh, Marka Valenta, who is the president of the Netherlands American Studies Association. Marka, the floor okay. is yours. Well, thank you very much, uh, Damien. Welcome, everybody. I want to join Damien in, in welcoming you. Um, it's fantastic uh, that we're able to have this lecture. You might not realize that this lecture is, in fact, kicking off uh, uh, the start, marking the start of a conference. Um, originally, it was to be part of a two-day conference that was going to take place uh, today and tomorrow. This was going to be the first uh, annual NASA uh, conference uh, the, in, in a while um, because the epidemic had disrupted it uh, for uh, some time and we were very excited to have the chance to be able to get together in person again uh, as the American Studies community of the Netherlands uh, and to engage uh, with the topic of the environment um, and to think through about you know how is it that from the perspective of American studies uh, we look at and contribute to uh, many of these discussions that are now taking place um, about the environment and then at the same time in terms of looking at American studies from the perspective of the environment uh, and in relation especially to the commitments that American studies has to issues of um, justice and to addressing those of uh, inequality, discrimination, exploitation, uh, and geopolit the, the inequalities and violence of geopolitics. Uh, 
And so that's why we're so excited to have Megan Black here. And I think this is really, really fantastic. Um, the conference now, rather than being two days, is going to be about six months. Uh, so we are going to start off with a discussion today uh, with Megan Black's uh, wonderful lecture and uh, then the Q&A to follow. That will lead into um, a number of um, informal uh, chats, conversations uh, with different participants uh, from this conference that we're organizing. And the, that is to sort of keep you excited and warm and engaged and get to know each other, uh, leading up to uh, hope, very, very hopefully, uh, a live gathering um, in the spring when we really can get together and have a formal conference with papers. Uh, and Megan Black is warmly invited to join us then. I don't know what your schedule is looking like, but it would be you know wonderful to be able to host you here for real. And um, so I just wanted you guys to know all of that. And I think that being said, um, uh, now, I think I've said the most, I'm looking at Dario, he doesn't realize it, but I'm trying to think of if I forgot anything. Um, the most important thing to mention, Megan Black is Associate Professor of History at MIT in Boston. She's written um, a gorgeous book called The Global Interior, Mineral Frontiers and American Power, uh, which is, looks at the ways in which the, the, the politics of the interior, in fact, uh, contribute to uh, and drive the projection of American power beyond uh, America. So looking in a very dynamic way at that relation of interior to exterior questions of power, of geopolitics and nature. And the lecture that she'll be giving uh, today uh, builds on that and draws from that uh, the environment and global American studies, the curious case of the US Interior Department. Megan Black. The floor is all yours. Amazing. Thank you, Marka. And thank you, Dario, for the invitation to speak with you all today um, and for the support from Rias. I'm so um, honored to be with you. And I understand that the <laughs> Dutch American Studies Association Conference has taken on this new form. It's great to hear about the innovation um, and how you're managing to kind of expand its scope across time and space. Um, I'll say, um, and I'll, I'll pull up slides here in a moment, but in thinking about the spatial dynamics, it might be worth kind of just fixing myself in, in space. I'm tuning in from um, Arlington, Massachusetts, in a bioregion in the Boston Basin that uh, the Wampanoag, Massachusetts, and Nipmuc people had um, harvested and stewarded and uh, shaped and made use of and for millennia. And, um, and I do think that that history, their engagement with the more than human environment, and um, their uh, continued coexistence in these spaces is helpful to, to kind of give you a sense of where I am, but also I will be dealing with histories of settler colonialism. So um, helpful, perhaps to to flag this in talking about an institution that was designed to oversee that process, even as it could never fully determine it. Um, and I'll say that thinking about this, the career, the strange career of the US Interior Department with the specific um, categories of environmental studies and global American studies is really useful and refreshing for me. So I, I kind of re reflecting and looking back on the writing of the book, it becomes clear how, um, how enabling those uh, kind of literatures were. And so I'm gonna to try to draw that out in my conversation today. Um, even as I um, sort of situate myself in the history side of our interdisciplinary shared project, I understand that there's also kind of literary um, studies enfolded into your proceedings. So, so to do that, I'm going to, you know, do the share screen. Let's all cross our fingers and hold our breath, but hopefully you're seeing something right now that resembles uh, not human faces. And um, as I start to advance, feel free to unmute and yell at me if the slides don't seem to be going as well. Um, but I'm going to uh, to start out, as historians often do, with a, a little story. <laughs> so um, it begins in February of 1967 with the Secretary of the Interior, Stuart Udall, depicted here on the left with his signature bolo tie, who was embarking on a two-week journey across the Middle East. 
his tour included a stopover in Saudi Arabia, where he um, was seemingly far away from the American West that had helped to shape his career. He was a politician from Arizona who famously oversaw several land use projects, including hydroelectric dams and wildlife refuges. Um, although his stated purpose in the Middle East was to deal with what many were framing as a neutral project of environmental management, including national park creation, he simultaneously undertook activities that few had come to see as neutral, and that involved oil politics in the Middle East. His main purpose in Saudi Arabia was to investigate and smooth over uh, U.S. oil interests under King Faisal in Saudi Arabia, who you'd all referred to as that old camel raider. And Arab news media suspected as much and charged Udall with manipulating the oil economy. But what really fascinated me about this, um, this set of interactions in Saudi Arabia was that Udall sought to distance himself from that supposed project, that accusation that he was involved in oil politics with the following justification. He said he was just an innocent minister of the interior who should be called minister of natural resources. And for him, the implication was seemingly clear. What could he or the US interior department for that matter have to do with the politics of the world? So as Marka indicated, this is a, a topic that I take up in my recent book, The Global Interior, Mineral Frontiers in American Power. I take up the, that question of what could the Interior Department have to do with the world? And I ultimately see that it has had far more to do than had been previously documented or imagined. So a few words on the US Interior Department, especially in an international audience are, are really important here because this department is fundamentally different from ministries of the interior on which it was loosely modeled from European contexts. So today the interior department is an arm of the government known for managing natural resources and the nation's parks, as well as supervising indigenous affairs. And its remit in environmental management is often imagined to be confined to the home. But in the 20th century, the interior department oversaw a quest for minerals in particular that moved across a seemingly disparate array of zones. And this included Native American lands, uh, formal US territories like the Philippines and Cuba, foreign nations, the oceans, and even outer space. So contrary to conventional wisdom, this department operated in a global and in some cases a more than global field. So while this had been staked out for more than a century, I find Udall, Stuart Udall, to be a very helpful figure in kind of leading a little whistle-stop tour around the department's surprising international remit. So he would not only venture to the Middle East, as just discussed, but he would also supervise Indian affairs, as seen here in a photo op with a Navajo elder at the dedication of a coal-fired power plant on the reservation. He would oversee territories like Guam and Samoa because US territories had fallen under the department's uh, remit since the New Deal. He would undertake diplomatic missions across Africa, Asia, and Latin America. Here we see him depicted in Santiago, Chile. Bolo Tai once again made the trip. And he was there to continue the work. <laughs> sorry, I'm so sorry, Megan. Don't this worry. Of before. course, you cannot you cannot anticipate and control that. And um, I'll I'll say that's the first one that I've seen bombed in that particular way. So there's a kind of creativity <laughs> there. Um, so I'll conclude by saying that um, this this kind of introductory frame that you'd all like the interior department also got involved in trying to pursue minerals in outer space, um, first in a rather fanciful attempt to mine the moon and later in a more serious uh, effort that involved using satellites to view resources from outer space. So if you could follow with me through, I can just kind of, I'll just give you the visual tour once again. Then, um, then you might, with me, try to think about what this kind of global navigation signals for us. Um, some might see it as the amusing um, but ultimately insignificant travels of a self-styled cowboy overseas or as the benign export of American technical modernity. Um, I ultimately suggest that we actually need to see it as an 
a form of connecting an institutional linkage between US settler colonialism and the projection of American power, capitalist interests, and ecological tolls overseas. So um, a, a bit about how to proceed for the time that remains, and I'll, I'll kind of um, maybe make some um, effort to expedite in, in service of having time and range for a Q&A, but I want to chart out briefly the key coordinates of my research horizon for you, and again, really draw out the ways that these interconnected projects of an environmental studies and transnational American studies help to um, make sense of this this history. A key argument I advance is that the Department of the Interior institutionalized a skill set that had been cultivated in 19th century settler colonialism that would ultimately come to underpin its environmental management. Environmental management, in turn, became a key mechanism for extending U.S. power, its personnel, and protocols overseas in the 20th century. And I'll try to kind of develop that briefly with you all. Um, before turning in the next section to thinking more about ideas and the way ideas about non-human nature help to justify U.S. intervention, something that I see really building on the rich tradition of the culture of U.S. imperialisms that were such as a cornerstone to transnational American studies and my training in an American studies program. Um, I, I noted that the observation folks in this era were making about nature was that it was borderless. And the uh, idea that nature was borderless helped to rationalize border crossings on a path to a global project of extraction. So I will be drawing on, on materials from the book, trying to cast new light on, on some of those sections by calling attention to my process, writing it. And I'll end by turning to some new research questions that are opening out for me that help us, I think, reflect on questions of environmental justice in the age of anthropogenic climate change, but also as we think about a possible much hoped for renewable energy transition. So first, this interior department that ignited many curiosities for me because the apparent, interior, the apparent paradox of interior people and exterior places was something that I noted early while doing dissertation work in Washington, DC. I was working in the National Archives when I began to see that interior personnel were trading domestic assignments across the US West or in Washington, DC for one scattered across Afghanistan, Iran, um, Thailand, and beyond. And I'll say that part of how I came to see this in the first place was tied to my training in American studies. I was very much thinking about cultural production. And I, at the National Archives, had seen films like the ones you see depicted here, titles like The Evolution of the Oil Industry, that were co-produced by the US Interior Department and members of industry, whether it's Phelps Dodge Corporation or Standard Oil, and that these films, with these fascinating narratives that they were spinning about kind of global resources were circulating to Afghanistan and Iran and Thailand and elsewhere. And I quickly realized that they were circulating because interior personnel were circulating overseas. Um, and in that sense, both institutionally and ideologically interior was exterior. So this apparent um, contradiction was something that quickly got explained to me through another kind of source, which was textual documents at the National Archives, as I encountered a speech by one um, interior assistant secretary who was explaining the increasingly international remit of the department um, in remarks on United Nations Day in 1952. And Northrop was explaining this by saying that the work in the so-called undeveloped world or underdeveloped world made sense when you considered the department's history managing the American frontier. So here is a quote from him. Once it was the undeveloped West of the 1850s, which constituted a primary reason for the establishment of this department and conditioned its development. Now it is the underdeveloped areas of the free world of the 1950s. We have the know-how and skills needed to make an important contribution to the opening of this frontier. So sources like Northrop were challenging me. They were helping me to see that it actually wasn't at all strange that the interior department 
was operating overseas and at the forefront of US expansionism. Rather, the fact that it appeared to me as strange was itself a problem that needed to be interrogated. In other words, there was a lot of ideological work that this department did um, in a broader project of US exceptionalism, as I'll kind of return to in a moment. So Northrop's challenge here actually pushed me further back in time to that mid 19th century moment. And I learned that the department had been founded in response to the US war with Mexico. Um, and in important ways, its task was tied to the work of the projection of US power across the continent. So founded on March 3rd, 1849, it was a time when the, the kind of fledgling federal government struggled to keep pace with rapid transformations tied to um, this proliferation of um, of territory or this vast increase of territory and a proliferation of land claims tied to it. One example that is um, really useful is to think of the discovery of gold um, in Sutter's Mill in Northern California, an event which we know culminated in a genocide against California Indians. Interior employees had trailed behind the U.S. Army and work to incorporate expropriated land into the national fold, preparing it for capitalist utilization and settlement. And they were of course joined by other institutions, including the railroad corporations, but they did a lot of day-to-day -day work to help subordinate this terrain and indigenous nations with prior claims to it. They oversaw surveying, parceling, codifying, disposing, settling, and utilizing of land. In other words, I came to see them as facilitating important processes that historian Frederick Jackson Turner would cite as having helped to bring about a close of the American frontier. And the frontier is a highly charged category to be sure, one that has been a very ubiquitous feature of the many subfields that I claim is my own. So where Turner saw an origin for American democracy in this concept of the frontier, a supposed boundary between wilderness and civilization, scholars hailing first from the Wisconsin School of US Foreign Relations and, and later and increasingly in the subfield of American studies saw a dynamo propelling American interventions in the 20th century. Some attributed that more to material drives while American studies scholars were really thinking about the symbolic force of the frontier and its racial and national and gendered ideologies to that, that connected project. And it was in this crucible that um, we also get a kind of origin or a, at least a catalyzing moment for American exceptionalism, the idea that the United States was fundamentally different from and superior to other nations. The frontier experience supposedly explained that. U.S. environmental historians were also really interested in this frontier category, but more for its invitation to bring the material landscape into the from the background into the forefront of the study of U.S. history. So one scholar, Donald Worcester, was you know in the 1980s really in focusing on how the attempt to conquer nature was central to. Um, the kind of growth of the federal machinery for um, a nation building project. And he saw this as being especially evident in processes like the creation of irrigation networks and dams across the arid West in this foolhardy attempt to try to make, um, make this land into a patchwork of small farms in keeping with the Jeffersonian ideal. And we actually see this history in the, the image in front of you is a mural that um, romanticizes and sanitizes this. We get no sense of the real contests over water, the dispossession um, and the, the tremendous failures of climate um, as is often discussed relative to wildfire crises um, emanating from these, these decisions about uh, redirecting and rerouting water. So others we know in, in more recent years have really challenged the tidiness of the idea that there is this line on the map, or in other words, they've challenged the binaristic logic of the frontier and showed instead the real hybridity and, um, and kind of intermingling of, of uh, 
webs of human and non-human assemblages in zones, whether we call them borderlands or, or other kinds of spaces. So this literature, what I'm trying to, to summarize and in, in some ways oversimplifying is very much spanning the fields of transnational American studies and environmental studies. And I see that as just a really critical foundation that, that my book is trying to build from. And what I see is that these frontier processes conditioned a skill set and know how of expansion that underpinned what often seems to be an apolitical form of environmental management. And that this know how, kind of building on Worcester's ideas, but taking it in new directions, would be and was consistently directed to other projects of US global reach. Minerals were an important part of the natural resource agenda, in part because of their increasing value to society, but also because other arms of the government would emerge to, to kind of claim expertise over, say, what I'll call biological resources. Here I'm thinking of the US Department of Agriculture. But minerals are interesting to me because they also provide frontiers or something like a frontier in that they pose certain terrestrial limits um, that can be pursued. Um, and in that regard, the Interior Department's mineral agencies, the U.S. Geological Survey and Bureau of Mines, could consistently be enlisted to new fronts of activity in search of these finite resources. And it made sense to me then, the further I looked into this, that in 1899, with the supposed, you know, close of the American frontier and the imperial projection overseas in the Philippines, Cuba, Puerto Rico, and elsewhere, interior officials were among those first waves of Americans venturing to the new um, imperial territories and holdings to, to do things like survey for minerals and try to promote American capital investment on the ground. So that's a lot of kind of 19th century um, backstory to what I want to emphasize today, thinking about that 1950s period that Northrop was referencing and speaking in. So Northrop was writing in what was described as a post-colonial world, one where um, the kind of key arena of activity that he was addressing involved international development, as we now call it, but um, at the kind of 1949, 1950 moment, it was um, known as the Point Four program launched by President Harry Truman. So this was a foreign policy extending American scientific and technical expertise to so-called backward areas of the world. And it represented a key launch pad for modernization, which overtly sought to bring about social improvement. And as all of the US officials in this time were trying to make clear, it was not meant to be about exploitation. In fact, Truman summarized the old imperialism, exploitation for profit has no place in our plans. There's just the small problem that some US officials did still wish to retain key benefits of imperialism, including differential access to raw materials sourced by a highly racialized form of labor. And as part of their ongoing Cold War competition with the Soviet Union, the United States used well-documented tactics to secure strategic resources. Some of these are now well-known, including their involvement in the notorious case of helping to orchestrate a coup that ousted Iran's popularly elected leader, Mohammad Mossadegh, in 1953, on grounds that um, the leader was obstinately cutting off supplies of oil to the United States and Great Britain and the generalized West. So these interventions have drawn just scrutiny, but the United States also relied in more inconspicuous and day-to-day -day efforts to reshape landscapes in ways that served these extractive goals. And this is where my interior department um, historical actors come back into the forefront because interior technicians became embedded in places like Iran, Colombia, the Philippines, Egypt, and more than you know, three dozen countries in the kind of first wave of international development. In the process, they drew upon institutional experiences, past and ongoing, with US settler colonialism. And you know, I can go deeper into that. Um, but 
many uh, had experiences in, for example, Native American reservations of the West, but also just doing very standard practices that had been so crucial to the 19th century period, including strategic mineral surveys, conducting laboratory tests, which were becoming increasingly sophisticated in the 1950s, developing and mechanizing mines so that they would, the mines in foreign nations would produce more than just subsistence or local use levels of raw materials that would then need to be traded internationally as part of a key goal of the international development agenda. They would also help to revise mining codes to make foreign ownership of mines legal. Um, and they would consult with American corporations in foreign contexts. So um, these kinds of tactics allowed them to know with increasing precision the amount of ore, the grade of ore, and the precise location of ore. And, you know, it entailed a large um, process of um, changing landscapes overseas, even though as this kind of um, this table in front of you suggests, while we can begin to see a pattern, there is no uniform experience of how this takes shape. And it's worth noting that distinctive political, economic, cultural, and geographic realities certainly determined um, these activities or shape them in, in different ways. What I wanna draw, draw out though, is that slowly and painstakingly interior geologists and mineral experts completed important spade work for extractive firms like National Lead Company in Mexico or Texas Gulf Sulfur Company and Standard Oil in Egypt. And at the same time, interior personnel involved in this point four program and international development were drawing upon methods from the Bureau of Indian Affairs. So we see this in this cover for um, a memoir about the Point Four mission in Iran. And this was the site of the same infamous coup that centrals or that figures centrally in US foreign relations history. In the lead up to that event, the coup, the Point Four agenda was alive and well in Iran. And William E. Warren, who's depicted in the sweater vest on the cover of his memoir here, was one former assistant secretary charged with leading the entire technical mission in this country. What qualified him? Well, he had a background in reclamation in California, and he oversaw some education uh, reforms and in reservations, including Navajo Reservation in the US West. And um, after leaving his desk job in 1951, to, um, to take an office in Tehran, he explained that interior officials operating what he, in what he called exterior places were to apply techniques proved valuable in the Indian service to encourage isolated peoples to adopt modern methods in their work and to utilize their resources to their own best possible advantage. So that's a quote from Warren. The resource most central to Warren uh, was oil. And he argued that Mossadegh's move to expropriate these oil operations marked both an act of fanatical nationalism, that's his term, and a tremendous failure to understand oil's value. So once the coup happened, the, which Warren did not seem to have a hand in, Warren was still able to focus on doing his job and helping to implement new geological surveys in Iran, organizing a new petroleum industry. He claimed to help set up the template for what became um, British Petroleum, and that he was helping to open up new resource investments in Iran. For these kinds of mineral agendas to take place in a program that claimed to dispense with imperialism was a little bit tricky or a little contradictory. So one question that kind of accompanied my uh, uncovery of this history was how did a, a dynamic that so closely resembled the old imperialism in the sense that it exploited raw materials for distant beneficiaries, how did that manage for many officials to appear as a benevolent undertaking? You know, how did it seem to be uh, anti-imperialist? Answering that question requires thinking alongside these officials about um, ideas about nature. So in promoting 
the Interior Department's mineral programs, officials put forward a vision of a borderless nature that required American experts to cross borders to properly take care of them. So I'm gonna to return to Vernon Northrup on United Nations Day, who explained this dynamic um, and how it was a global and environmental good with this quote, natural resources, land, water, and minerals know no national boundaries. Like earth of which they are a part, they are global. Northrop's observation here, it, it categorizes as a, a kind of set of ideologies that I, I call resource globalism, which I see as helping with the problem of borders. National borders had become highly politicized in 1945 with the founding of the United Nations, the very event that occasioned Northrop's speech. And as the UN upheld self-determination, ideas about nature and the idea that they were borderless, helped other officials to downplay political borders, but always selectively and when in the interests of the United States. And we see this idea readily apparent in the cover for Resources for Freedom, which was an influential report on post-war resource scarcity that Interior made important contributions to. So when I first saw this in the archive, this is at the Truman Library, I was struck by the fact that this globe didn't, it didn't have national borders on it because it didn't even depict continents. And instead on this kind of empty expanse on this grid, there are resources awaiting utilization, hydroelectric dams, atomic energy facilities, oil derricks, mines, and so forth. So natural resources dominate while national sovereignty falls from view entirely. And you can see how this logic, the idea that nature was borderless and that natural resource experts should therefore develop resources for the benefit of all, could also so easily betray the extractive ambitions because that kind of universalizing logic just as easily could be interpreted as effectively deterritorializing the American interior and projecting it onto a global screen. And many officials in the post-war era cited nature as a means to do this work of justification of, of expanding influence. Um, and I'll say that ideas about nature have certainly, and for many centuries, been part of a justification for imperialist projects. Settler colonial rationales, we know, um, claimed that they should seize land on grounds that indigenous populations misused it. And there are certainly echoes of this thinking in what I call resource primitivism in the post-war era, but it does seem to hold less force and be less common, especially after 1945, than just a, a recourse to ideas about non-human nature and its supposed absence of borders. So this move was particularly useful for US officials because bound up with the idea that nature was borderless was the idea that nature was apolitical. And it was this commitment to a binary between politics and nature that would allow Stuart Udall to make a plea of political innocence in Saudi Arabia rooted in the fact that he was merely a minister of natural resources. So this is not to suggest that foreign audiences bought the argument. And I do try to take um, time in the book to think through the ways that interior technicians on the ground met with different kinds of resistance. Um, there were certainly mine workers who striked on point four mining projects and caused much concern back in Washington, DC. We know numerous third world leaders would become more militant in seeking explicit protection for their resources through the United Nations and also through forming consortium, through forming cartels like the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries, and that the United States Interior Department was constantly shifting in responses to these new challenges, taking imaginative steps to deal with the problem, whether in the depths of the ocean or in the final frontier of outer space, they were seeking a way to or seeking pathways to new frontiers for minerals um, in response to decolonization. 
Um, and part of what their solution became was to turn attentions closer to home, including in indigenous lands in the United States. And I want to just end the discussion today by reflecting how in the course of writing the global interior, I encountered many vibrant movements that took on bold and transnational strategies to try to contest this logic of global resources, to try to contest the presence of US personnel in their affairs. And this was evident in the founding of one pan-tribal coalition as I kind of ended there with, um, with US officials returning attention to US uh, lands or lands that were imperfectly labeled as part of the United States because they fell under the semi-sovereign um, extent of indigenous nations. And this coalition in 1975 called itself the Council of Energy Resource Tribes as the energy crisis was incentivizing more exploration and investment on their lands. They also controversially self-labeled as uh, the Indian OPEC, trying to chart connections imaginatively with people around the world who were leading the kind of decolonization uh, challenge to resource exploitation exploitation overseas. So, um, so in a final chapter of the book, I, I chronicle the ways that their transnational uh, affiliations, some symbolic, some tangible, for instance, they hired Iran's former minister of finance and oil to be their economist, helped them to call attention to the shame of the old interior department as they referred to um, the agency and help to negotiate some fairer terms um, and draw a more neutral form of technical expertise um, as they tried to make decisions about land use in their reservations. Now, the coalition was not without critics. It certainly embraced capitalist solutions and just wanted fairer terms of, say, Exxon arriving in their reservation. But what stands out to me is the decidedly global view that it took to challenge the, the seemingly apolitical narrative of interiors and by extension America's environmental management. And as I continue to be fascinated by how people on the ground respond to uh, the arrival of extractive firms and the American state, I'm working on a new project at the moment that centers local campaigns against a specifically metals-based mining in the post-1970s period. Um, so why the 1970s? Well, we certainly know it's a crisis of energy and we know important things about the increasing dependence on fossil fuels and the dynamics tied to that. I have come to see it in this period as a kind of crisis of extraction writ large, as many finite minerals came to underpin the revolutions and communication and transportation associated with globalization. Um, so this proliferation of investments in mining creates enormous multinational corporations on a path to what David Harvey has called the financialization of everything. And as companies are scouring the globe for resources, uh, they are certainly confronting grassroots resistance that are emboldened both by decolonization, as I've mentioned, but also environmental politics. And a question that I've had is, is how, how does one counter this formidable power um, and the encompassing reach of some of the largest and most well-resourced organizations in the world? And so in my new research, I'm trying to think about the, how these international dimensions of mining in this period of intense globalization compelled local communities to broaden their own worldviews. And it's a process that was greatly supported by the internationalization of NGOs like Friends of the Earth, which is depicted here. Um, and focusing on a particular case, one, um, one example of a local anti-mining campaign in Colorado, I'm going to be trying to test Friends of the Earth slogan, okay, which was think globally, act locally, and ask how what communities may have been able to accomplish by doing that work of thinking globally and acting locally against mining firms. And preliminary research suggests that global thinking opened up certainly important opportunities, valuable knowledge exchanges, 
um, and ready-made countermeasures and talking points in a kind of national and international scale. Um, but there were also some real shortcomings that tended to exacerbate certain blind spots um, as transnational networking actually distracted from, and in some cases even foreclosed pathways for organizing closer to home, including interracial solidarity and solidarity across regions. So such activism, both its, its possibilities and limitations really resonates, I think, in our contemporary moment as an environmental justice movement tries to build a more just and sustainable world. And as activists across borders, racial lines, age brackets, and other categories of identity call for bold action to address anthropogenic climate change, attention to these histories is important. I mean, history helps us to understand the, the multiple and frequently occluded origins of the climate crisis and where the kind of fossil fuel society came from in the first place and how it did so at expense often of nations across the global south or you know, communities within uh, nations that had been marginalized. But it also helps us to see how environmental management itself posed as a solution to the problem has also shared in many of the assumptions and projects of expansionism that have fueled anthropogenic climate change. In other words, the capacities to facilitate a systematic push outward must be addressed in order for these environmental institutions and ideas which have done much good to be able to continue to do good and to do good on an even larger scale. And there, um, there's also plenty of evidence in my mind of people who at the sites of thousands of mines <laughs> getting uh, built up across the world we're mobilizing, we're thinking globally, we're trying to short circuit some aspects of extractive business as usual. Um, and that they made a lot of mistakes in the process and also found some really, um, really inspiring and creative means to, uh, to make their campaigns a success. Uh, so I hope that in these kinds of activities, um, we see the seeds of collaborative transnational and indeed multidisciplinary efforts to build a politics that does center environmental and social well-being. And it seems like we need all the seats that we can get for that agenda. So um, I look forward to thinking through these issues that I've put in front of you. I just want to thank you for, um, for your <laughs> patient um, persistence in this. And I'm happy to pull at all these different threads in a Q&A. So thanks. Okay. <laughs> we did it. We got it. Thank you. Thank you so we got much. through. Thank you, so much for that. Thank you so much for that, Megan. And I apologize again for this hack um, that happened at the beginning of your talk. Um, that has not happened to us before. I've heard of it happening to others. So I look forward to the next like cocktail party when I can be like, oh yeah, that happened to us too. That's crazy. Exactly. Right? We've got it. We now thank thank you but for being a you, part of that experience. Yes. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much for your um for your talk. And your your this fascinating link that you like that you lay between um that you make between um sort of the uh, 19th century projects of expansion development of the west so-called and, and uh, settler colonial, colonialism and then mid 20th century um, sort of appropriation of global resources as uh, sort of the new frontier um, in, 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 uh, in foreign relations. I think that's that's really a fascinating link and one that I had not thought of um, before. Um, so I, that you, you touched upon so many themes and I have I scribbled down several uh, poorly formulated questions, just things that I'd like to know more about. But I want to before we um, start, I, I want to ask the, the audience that um, if you do have a question, uh, please feel free to raise your hand using the little icon. Uh, at the bottom, and you can also feel free to to turn your cameras on uh, now that we're sort of in the plenary section. So I already see a hand raised by um, Michael. Go ahead, Michael. Yes, uh, good afternoon. Thanks for your really uh, fascinating talk, Megan, a uh, wonderful talk. Um, I have a question uh, that relates to what you said uh, earlier. Um, you mentioned that you build on Donald Worcester's work, and you, you argue mm -hmm. that um, 
well, you take your cue from his his work uh, on um, um, irrigation networks and and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. I was thinking a little bit about uh, um, Perrin Seltzer's book on the mm -hmm. UN. Uh, yeah, I don't know yeah. if you engage with his work mm -hmm. in in your own book, which I haven't read, but I will. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. But uh, what he observes struck strikes me as very similar to your narrative. Mm -hmm. but then on the level of international diplomacy and so on. Yeah. Um, and what I find particularly interesting is, is how he argues how some kind of perspective from everywhere emerges, which mm -hmm. makes it very difficult yeah. to critique yeah. um, um, these scientific um, projects. Um, so he links um, these... Um, colonial ventures to the, the conceptual development of climate as a global imaginary mm -hmm. uh, in the post-war period. Yeah. Um, I, I'm curious to hear from you what you think about this and how it relates to your own project. Yeah. Great. Thanks so much, Michael. Thanks so much for bringing Perrin's wonderful book into the conversation, because I agree, it really takes the, the kind of global and international and uses the multilateral institutions or the networks of scientists who have similar histories with colonial projects and, um, and kind of works from the other direction. I um, So his book came out just shortly after mine. So unfortunately I wasn't able to engage with it and, and cite it there, but I have been able to reflect on you know, some of the incredible, like dazzling insights in it, including, you know, he has this comment about, you know, the, the planner's fantasy of a world without people. Um, that phrase was very resonant for me. I'm like, yes, it's the, that is the kind of global interior project too. So then I try to think about the work that the global frame does for a genuinely multilateral institution with its asymmetries, with it, you know, inequalities between and across its membership versus a, a nation with unilateral interests that are, are quickly expressed and actioned. And so I think what, what Salzer's work has helped to clarify for me is the selectivity of when things are global and when things are national. And often, you know, um, you know, there may be like investment in emboldening scientific undertakings, which also help to conduct, say, an inventory of resources. And then seeing, well, what's the next step? Who, who is going to help capitalize um, on this? And often what they'll say is, oh, well, we need, you know, uh, mining is a capital intensive venture. We must have some uh, entity, most of them that are well-financed are in America's Wall Street, darn, you know? So then all of a sudden the collaborators become not perfectly American. And I don't want to say that multinational entities can just perfectly and easily map onto nation states. So in this kind of post-war period, there was still a little bit more alignment in contention, you know. Um, so, so I do think that I want to hold out, you know, a faith in, in thinking transnationally and thinking globally about transborder problems, hunger, and, you know, resources and pollution as we, we configure it today. Um, but to think about the moments where the moves become, you know, like a rubber band snapping back <laughs> in ways that further, um, in the U.S. case, a lot of Cold War objectives. So while there could have been multilateral efforts to develop resources for countries that genuinely wanted industrialization, Cold War competition with the Soviet Union meant instead the U.S. would punish nations like Egypt when they accepted any additional aid, you know. So we, we know that story from other thinkers, and I think um, Perrin's work just shows how contingent that that thinking is. It wouldn't have to be um, one that uniformly uh, projected power, but um, but certainly um, there was consistent examples of it doing so in, in U.S. Uh, versions. So thanks, thanks for that. Thanks, Michael, for your question. Um, and we were uh, we also have uh, questions from Marika and Janine. So I'll, I'll start with Marika. Okay, well, thank you very much, Megan, for a really fascinating talk. It's, it was wonderful to hear you. Um, I've, got, I've got two questions, and I'll just phrase them very quickly so that I can get two of them in. 
Uh, so, so the first, and they're very unrelated to one another. So the first one is uh, about Deb Haaland. And uh, so, yeah. so as, a, as a native New Mexican, right, I am mm -hmm. uh, incredibly proud, you know, that, that uh, she's been named Secretary of the Interior um, and mm -hmm. she's a member of Laguna Pueblo. Mm -hmm. At the same time, right, if I listen to your account, um, mm -hmm. it, I cannot imagine, right, that she would be able to, to halt or even steer this kind of a dynamic, right? So then it seems as if, even though it's fantastic that she's been named, that there's also an element of co-optation. Mm -hmm. um, so, mm -hmm. so I just wonder sort of how do you weigh those, like if you're looking at, at what's happening now, how mm -hmm. do you weigh those against one another? Right. Um, Question. Now I'll leave it at that. I have a second question. I'll sort of see how the conversation goes and then okay. maybe I'll bring it in later, but Perfect. yeah, just to give others great. a chance to. Thank you. What a great question. And to kind of share the enthusiasm of the moment of her appointment, like I, I, I wouldn't have anticipated that move in, you know, the time when I was finishing up the epilogue of the book. And there is, I think, much to celebrate in even just the representational politics of that. Um, I'll I'll come back to Holland by kind of first gesturing back to partisan shifts across the department's time. You know, there are clearly appointees who are secretaries of the interior for um, Republican and Democratic administrations that uh, nominally have very different politics. And I, you do see the effects to an extent of a, a new person at the helm. So some classic examples would be like Albert Fall, Harding's Secretary of the Interior at the center of the Teapot Dome scandal was all in favor of privatization of public lands under what had been indigenous lands, what then become Interior's mandate, and um, and did to did so to such an extent as to call attention to the corrupt <laughs> nature of that, um, and and then he would be put out of place, and Harold Ickes under FDR would then have um, 12 years, 13 years to kind of shape um, a politics that embraced conservation. And these might seem like totally opposed, but what I found is that there was a kind of mutually reinforcing, regardless of these partisan shifts, mutually enforcing idea that extracting resources elsewhere was a good thing. So there may be kind of variation on the, the strength of conservation policies at home, but a flip side, regardless of whether there's privatization or conservation at home, there is a sense that exploiting resources that are scarce in the United States, wherever they are, is fine. And there is some, some nuance needed there to talk about the, the kind of independent Western mining contingent of like political stakeholders. You can probably in New Mexico can think of people who, you know, on a smaller scale wouldn't want competition from Chilean copper mines or whatnot. But, but, um, but this seemed to be a pretty consistent motif, but also the period I look at does see a lot of kind of liberal leaning at kind of progressive um, conservation oriented administrations in power with a long frame. So the, the Ickes and Udall. And then James Watt in the 80s was like, burn it down, you know, like, let's get privatize everything. Um, but, you know, it was too, too stark, too dramatic to the extent that even conservative people felt that he was out of line. So, so I do think that, you know, this, this problem is certainly now on the shoulders of, of a woman who's done so much to, to change some key tenets of how people in that position speak about fossil fuels. I mean, in many ways, it is uh, she is the first person to have said anything about decarbonization, to have really avowed the perils um, to climate posed by, um, by fossil fuels. I mean, others have skated around this and, um, and she's on the record doing different things. But I do think you, you see, and probably like I do, the headlines about Biden and by extension Holland authorizing leases for offshore drilling in a period where we know that uh, it just needs to stay in the ground. So, um, so I think, of course, it's important. I think there's a real opportunity for her to help call attention to the connections between the projects of decolonization and decarbonization that are needed. But it's it's much to ask one person to shoulder, and um, and there's. There's, I think, a lot of um, support that 
that one would need to really rethink and rewire the institution so that it's not just, you know, promoting capitalism is our job, which is very often how it services government or how it serves, how it serves a kind of public interest, even as corporations are quick to just say, oh, they're just regulatory red tape. Um, I see that they are very much a promotional arm and there is regulation, but often those capacities are undercut with budget cuts year after year after year. Long answer to this very important question, but I'm very excited to kind of monitor this with you all. Thanks, Megan, and thanks, Marka, for your question. Um, Janine, Janine, nice to see you again. Good to see you. Thank you so much for this talk. This was so fascinating. I feel like I've learned so much and I love the connections that you make between the internal and external. That's so fascinating. Um, I have a question that might be a bit left field, but I'm just wondering what you think, um, which is that expansionism and conquest in the 19th century and even like early 20th century was often conceived in very gender terms mm -hmm. as a sort of like masculine venture abroad and also the, the language that was used of, of conquering and of extraction mm -hmm. um, and I'm really curious if you see that in the time period that you study um, mm -hmm. if, if nature is at any way, or like these resources are in any way gendered in a certain way, mm -hmm. um, and how, if, if they see that, and if that uh, shows up in your research, that'd be really yeah. interesting. Thank you. So great question. Thanks so much for, um, for bringing that to the forefront, because I think that it gets far too little attention on the page, even as I think it's so important. And, you know, I, was very um, influenced in graduate school by thinking like Anne McClintock's work. I, I saw that constantly in the way that mapping seemingly, you know, um, value and gender neutral features of a landscape as a man's enterprise quickly <laughs> became, um, became gendered. So virgin land is like a key example that is constant, whether we're talking about the 1840s or the 1970s, people are very unselfconsciously just saying, look, there's virgin land, it's great. And that's um, a place where we, we see that kind of normalization of exploiting land through this sense that it is ripe and await awaiting um, taking. So there's no way to kind of extricate that from um, patriarchal uh, values. And um, there, I will say, as just kind of briefly, I, I had a slide on even the activism side of it. You might have noticed like the very last um, slide sees a town uh, in Colorado protest a mine that they colloquially call the Red Lady. And there is much to unpack about that, but it's hardly distinctive to, um, to see mountains and mines named after women and, um, and treat it as something that, <laughs> whether it needs to be protected from outside exploitation, kind of conforms to these narratives of active and passive. Um, and so even both sides of this, <laughs> whether it's a pro-mining or anti-mining, kind of share in that gendered logic and certainly aid and international development, people like Joanne Myrowitz have written about the like the passive gendered feminine aid recipient and the active expert knowledge producer and, and land shaper. So, so those I think are alive and well and helping again, just adding more to help naturalize certain ways of interacting with and shaping material landscapes. So thank you for that. Thanks, Janine, and thanks, Megan. Uh, Frank? Yes, thanks, Megan, for that inspiring talk. I really enjoyed it and uh, also got a lot of interesting ideas. I'm particularly interested in visual culture. Oh. And uh, I found it fascinating that you uh, had one slide with Frank McKenzie's mural uh, that was uh, yeah. exhibited or commissioned even by the Department of the Interior. And you used that image uh, to talk about uh, settler colonialism, Jeffersonian approaches to, to nature. Uh, I thought that was a very interesting uh, point to make. And of course, that triggered a, a lot of issues in my mind about uh, the intersection of culture and politics uh, and the uh, 
the ongoing myth of American exceptionalism. Uh, mm. I think um, uh, Laura Foss also mentioned uh, this uh, in uh, in her chat that there's a kind of a natural claim uh, in the American mind of uh, taking resources, not only uh, within the American borders, but on, on a global scale. And uh, I was wondering if, uh, if, if the element of how culture is complicit uh, with creating a, an exceptionalist fantasy uh, and also framing uh, these ext extraction industries uh, in a way that is, uh, you know, leading, f following an idea of, uh, yeah, American exceptionalism. So I was wondering if that link that you suggested in one of these slides, how visual yeah. culture uh, is, is complicit, uh, if that will also play a more important role in your next work. Uh, yes, um, uh, well observed. And um, while I don't discuss this particular mural in the book, which I regret <laughs> on some level, I'll say that my experience encountering it in person and others like it walking through the interior department building was very influential when I was a grad student. So I was lucky to work, like to be in school five blocks away from the interior department. I was able to do research in their library, but just you can mill about, you know, and you can see the kind of connections as you move through space and you see the visual culture that narrates their history, which has been in place since the 1930s, right? Some of these things were commissioned, it took time to get on the walls, but you right. can see Harold Ickes in the 1940s with, you know, um, trail wagons and, you know, a very kind of um, manifest destiny uh, oriented uh, imagery behind him. And, and people, whether they're working on uh, minerals or national parks or indigenous affairs are moving through space and, and taking in these messages, which we know are in that building because they have wider popular cultural purchase. So it's not some idiosyncratic narrative for the department. It is also tied to the, the myth of the American Western. It is tied to, um, it is tied to the frontier, uh, right? The frontier and and kind of like the whole public works of the New Deal um, exactly. shared this kind of growth orientation that um, is expansion, even as it is asking about distribution in, in ways that are, are different from, from the kind of period before. So, um, so I do think, yes, culture is very complicit. And while you know, if we look to popular culture, we might see just a bit more friction or like variations on, you know, the sense of entitlement to appropriation of dispossession. So, um, you know, from thinking about this more in the earlier stages of the project, there are there are Westerns that come out that are very clearly like, you know, naturalizing through vanishing Indian stereotypes or other yeah. other frontier myths, the the entitlement or the the presence of white settlers in the kind of mythic space of the West, then you then you hear every now and then about and see kind of critical westerns like there's one oil film called Tulsa which is set in um, in Indian territory and really tells a story that's a bit more like um, what, what we know to have happened with the Osage murders um, around uh, murderous white stewards who, um, who took advantage and, uh, and stole land through these kinds of very troublesome trust relationships. So, so there was a kind of space for a wider range of interpretations, even as very often that which became popular was mediated by uh, kind of what elite white male uh, cultural producers. So um, I think that the the kind of cultural field gets wider and more variegated over time to the extent that, you know, the Council of Energy Resource Tribes is using its platform, trying very hard to engage and shape a national mainstream media through its, um, through its kind of imaginative uh, campaign. So um, yeah, there's there's so much to, to, to say with that. I'm kind of trying to quickly read Laura's comments, which seem really great and kind of in this thread too, but I might need a second to kind of process them. Um, so yeah, thank you. To be continued, thanks. To be continued, yes. Thanks, Frank. Uh, in the meantime, we will move on to Dario's question.
Uh, well, yeah, thank you. I mean, thanks a lot, Megan. This has been really fascinating. And uh, I also want to thank you on behalf of some of my students who were here. And, and I know they, they, they must have appreciated what you were saying because it was uh, really part and parcel of, of a course on the US and the global environment that we have had just really this semester. So it was very, very fitting. And I, uh, I wanted to ask you uh, two very quick questions. Oh, one was about this idea of the borderless nature of natural resources and especially its relationship with the national character of technology. Uh, and, and, you know, the, this sort of, of tension and in, especially when, when projected abroad, these ideas could at least for, from what I've seen in, in, in other fields, especially, you know, in the fields of for instance, the management of hazardous waste. Uh, it was the, the, the national character of technology that created forms of, of imperial uh, uh, dependency. So I was wondering if uh, these ideas and, and uh, the dialogue between these ideas, you know, the, the global nature of natural resources on the one hand and uh, uh, national nature of technology of know how and expertise, uh, if, if this debate in a way impacted the mindset of US policymakers, of US governance also beyond the interior mm. and percolated, you know, through, I don't know, the State Department, the EPA, if you have yeah. seen this in, in your research. The second mm. question was uh, related to your other project. Uh, I, I'm really writing uh, uh, the introduction of, of a book at the moment, and I'm using the category of translocalism mm. to explain this relationship between transnational movements and local campaigns. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I mean, I agree on everything you said on the fact that, you know, that there is a relationship um, uh, that sometimes is mutually advantages between local campaigns and transnational ad advocacy groups. But mm -hmm. I was wondering, uh, first of all, when do you locate chronologically this analysis? Mm -hmm. this analysis? And mm -hmm. if uh, the anti-toxics campaign, for instance, mm -hmm. this is part of the story, mm -hmm. because if that is so, then I am less sure that this relationship uh, tend to be detrimental at some times, as mm. you said, you know, with transnational mm. organizations, for instance, mm -hmm. not taking adequate care of, of interracial solidarity or gender mm -hmm. equality. Because in my own experience, it's actually the other way around. It's mm -hmm. the fact that there are transnational groups active and that these transnational groups have access to global governance, to global bodies, to multilateral settings that local campaigns can really have a voice in those settings, even for what concerns gender, racial and intersectional things. So I was wondering how yeah. does this play in your own research? Great. Yes. Yeah. So... First, to kind of think about the national nature of technology, I think you're very right to call attention to an added piece of the justification, um, a sense that uh, these tools that the US um, is helping to engineer are a part of a, a kind of um, a form of technology transfer that we know is valued and, and called for by say the NIEO in a later period. Um, but it's also often framed in a way that is determined by US objectives and priorities. So they will share technologies that are advantageous to share. So here, a part of the story of mine mechanization overseen through the international development process is sending US mining machinery that is no longer being used in the US context overseas. So, you know, arranging through these agreements, which are, you know, consensual of a kind in that there is a bilateral agreement, um, but then there is an agreement to purchase, say, the Denver hoist machine from the United States for the uh, coal mines in Afghanistan. And that, you know, this is framed as the benevolent uh, transfer of technology, and we see that in, you know, in Cuba in the 1940s or, or many, many places around the world. It's a problem, you know, kind of to get to Marxist language around like, the departments and the, you know, the modes of production. So, um, so that's a part of the technology transfer that is happening, but then we also know through like the negotiations around the continental shelf, which was highly there were debates about 
deep ocean mining in the 1970s, you know, really from the 50s forward, that the Interior Department was helping to shape. And they were actively excited about opening up the deep ocean floor for exploitation, even though that falls beyond the continental shelf and is in like a gray zone, much like outer space, right? Um, but U.S. leaders, including, you know, the Bureau of Mines, were working on technologies for like manganese nodule mining. And then at the same time, the NIEO was kind of saying that technology transfer could be a way to like address the problem of inequality between global north and global south. This would require that if we open the deep ocean floor, the U.S. needs to um, agree to share what it knows about technology. I mean, it's it reflects the technology or the, the patent logic that we see around vaccines to this day, whether that's proprietary, whether that's shared. And this is why the United States never signed the UN Conference on the Law of the Sea after all of those decades of negotiation. They didn't want to be obligated to share technology on deep ocean mining. So the second point about translocalism, so great, Great point. And I do think that the issues inventory matters here. Like what is the issue at the forefront? Your point about toxicity as something that helps to like cohere a more interracial politics and is really valuable. And I, I have seen, um, I, I see your points in, in many campaigns that were adjacent to say Friends of the Earth organizing, um, whether it's like acid rain versus other things. But to kind of your first question, this campaign is 77 to 81 that I'm really honing in on. And we know that um, CERCLA and Superfund site, for instance, is 1980 and after. So it's kind of the tail end of the activism. Um, but I'm trying to deal with, and I, I'm in very preliminary stages of knowing what I even think about what it is about mining that ends up feeling like, you know, it's different and specifically metals mining, where the nature of the problem is often heavy metals in the water source. So you might be talking about lead poisoning, you might be talking about um, cadmium and other things that are really dangerous for local communities, but it's even different from like the sulfur dioxide emissions of a refining, like a, um, of a, a copper smelter or a low sulfur strippable coal, which helps to kind of build a wider politics around what is possible. So whatever it is, the community that I look at that called their mountain, the Red Lady, um, which we can kind of return to that conversation, we're not seeing a very coinciding overlapping struggle that the Colville, the Confederated Bands of Colville Reservation were having with the same company over the same mineral at the same time. There was no effort to build um, connections between but there were efforts to go help people in New Zealand who were having a similar struggle and work with white communities 10,000 miles away. So that's the kind of problem that I'm seeing that's very specific to this kind of anti-mining campaign, even as, yeah, I like anti-nuclear activism. Also, there's so many examples I think we could point to where like apartheid is at the center of the, the concern or, or the, the kind of great solidarity networks carefully built up over decades um, are, are being activated through a kind of environmental lens. So I'm gonna hold on to that note for sure because I think it's important. Just just as a quick follow-up, there is a group that is called Keep It in the Ground. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and their papers are in Amsterdam, uh, the International Institute for Social History. So you have a reason uh, more why to, to come. To I, absolutely, yeah, that, that's awesome. Thanks, thanks so much. Okay, we have time for two very quick questions um, by uh, Gaetano and Marga. Is it an idea to maybe cluster the questions? Gaetano, you ask your question, Marga, you ask your question, and then give Megan the chance to sort of address them both in the last uh, couple of minutes. Is that okay? Mm -hmm. uh, yes, it's okay for me. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you, Megan, for, for, for your talk and also for your work, uh, yeah. which has been an inspiration in the last few years, and I'm sorry. For not having my camera map, but I'm uh, camera on, but I'm joining from, of all places, College Park National Archives, so I'm not sure I can even be doing this, so, yeah. but I wanted to, <laughs> to, uh, to, 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 to listen to you. Um, and so um, I have a question, and which is actually a, a request, if, which is if you could talk a little bit more about the relationship that the Interior Department had 
with other departments at that time were sure. auto operating in this global uh, mm -hmm. this global scenario uh, yeah. and i'm asking this because i work a little bit more specifically on the department of interior at the turn of the century at the beginning of the 20th century uh -huh. and and my impression is that in in those years uh, those interior officials who were emphasizing the need to survey and, and explore and appropriate and extract foreign materials already mm -hmm. at the time mm -hmm. were doing that among other things also to as a sort of fight for relevancy after yes. years in yeah. which uh, for a few decades in which the, the, the department of interiors had been seen as a sort of somehow somewhat corrupt institution after the way in which they were like managing the selling of, of the western land Mm -hmm. uh, and there were like other departments, for example, the Department of Agriculture that was uh, focusing on conservation. And so somehow also in order to again maintain funding mm -hmm. relevance, they were uh, finding a new mission that was to go abroad. Yeah. Um, so I was I was wondering if you'd say a little bit more about this, possibly this turf war yeah. within, within within the government. Great. Thank you. Cool. And then Marco's question too, and I'll try to sew them together. Okay, so where my question is, is uh, where I wanted to turn from is that we're now listening to this talk in an international setting, right? So, mm -hmm. and one of the things that I find really enriching about your, your approach is that it's something that also we can think about in other kinds of settings, right? So if you think about uh, the age of European imperialism, and the ways in which, say, the, the emergence of the United States, right, could be seen as a, as a projection of, uh, you know, European, uh, you know, needs for mineral extraction and for resources and so forth to the exterior, right? So the arrival in the U.S. and, and sort of the kinds of resources and drive for that, they were driving it. And then if we look to what's going on with China today and the ways in which China is, you know, projecting its need for resources and and you know going around the world and finding ways of securing it and gaining access and making arguments that it's doing it also in a better way than yeah. than you know the west does so um so to what extent you know is this in fact just uh, sort of the the uh, a dynamic of of great powers uh or uh, and or of uh, yeah, I mean, it's complex about, you know, we have different kinds of imperial powers, but thinking about it in those kinds of terms, where, where once you have an entity that gets a certain kind of power mm -hmm. to project itself, it goes about doing that, and that the U.S. is one in a line of great powers uh, that mm -hmm. have done that, uh, mm -hmm. with certain distinctive elements, but mm -hmm. not uh, unique. Mm -hmm. Okay, so... These questions are giving me a lot to think with, and I'll I'll start briefly with the the kind of departmental relations. I um, really think that that bureaucratic infighting piece is important, and legitimation is important for an arm of the government whose task was to, you know, do the work of westward expansion. And there was an institutional crisis and calls to close the office at the turn of the twentieth century, on grounds that it, you know was obsolete. And so there is an, a need to kind of suggest and recommend itself as having further and continued relevance. Um, the Department of War is like, and later Department of Defense is a kind of constant friction um, and they fight over jurisdiction in the management of um, what became the Bureau of Indian Affairs and what became the Office of the Territories. And I think that's one where we see um, squabbling, Department of Agriculture actually merged from the patent office that had been in the Interior Department in the 1860s. So Department of the Interior is sometimes called the mother of all bureaucracy. Um, but that doesn't mean there weren't tensions too. We see that the Forest Service is a classic example. Interior had for a time the Forest Service. It got moved with Gifford Pinchot's critiques and conservationist kind of impulses to agriculture on grounds that Interior squandered uh, and misused those lands. And those that throughout the 20th century, whether it's Stuart Udall or people before, they're trying to fight to get the Forest Service back. Um, there, I should note that, you know, the State Department, sometimes they're collaborators, sometimes they are pursuing different goals. So State Department overtly committed to social improvement, Interior Departments committed to strategic resources with less obvious benefit to local communities. So uh, 
those relationships are all, I think, really important. And then there's infighting within interior, which is not insignificant, but that I also see moving still in a kind of broader thrust. Um, so whether Fish and Wildlife Service temporarily gets a moratorium on oil drilling, very often there's still going to be drilling in the continental shelf. So the question of the kind of geopolitical and the consonants across different, um, different nations pursuing these kinds of global powers, I think I am just in my head saying, I wish we could phone in Julie Klinger, who's worked more specifically on rare earth frontiers and like the US China conversation. She's an amazing geographer who has pointed out that like, while it's often framed as, oh, these things are rare and automatically our geopolitical interest is in securing them, that in fact, rare earth elements are not rare. They are 17% of all of earth. <laughs> and that often they become a justification for different kinds of projects, which can have more fluidity to them. In her argument, it's um, it often is tied to controlling borderlands, uh, is a claim that she makes looking at the kind of 50s period in, in China. Um, and I can't I can't convey her her insights with the the kind of magistry that they you know that they deserve. But but I do think that that book has me thinking more about um, about the counterintuitive ways that you know there may be a lot of consonant um, experiences across time and space, but that there's decent amount of contingency and what objectives those might actually be servicing. Um, so that's that's kind of a, a big picture thing, but I did hope in writing this book that it could be useful to people who wanted to do comparative work. And so the, the nature of your question, Marka, is really, it's encouraging for me as well. I hope people take that up. So, thank yeah. You. Thank you so much, Megan. Um, just following up on that. So we're out of time. Yes. <laughs> but I, I did have a question uh, this whole time and I was, uh, sort of saving it. And I'm just going to pose it to you as a parting gift. And you don't okay. have to answer it because really <laughs> there's no time to answer it. Please. But um, just following up actually on that on that last point, um, I was kind of, uh, I'm sailing dangerously close to actually Eva's uh, research specialty here. But I was wondering when you showed that map of like the, the four point program and the underdeveloped yeah. world. And yes. I, I um, you know, I noticed Africa is, is considered completely uh, underdeveloped. And uh, mm -hmm. in 1950, we're talking about the eve of decolonization in Africa. And I'm sort of wondering if um, if these these uh, American uh, Interior Department officials um, or if the American government is perceiving perhaps the, the potential of um, an American hand in managing natural resources in Africa uh, mm -hmm. on the eve of decolonization, if this is sort of perceived as a critique on European colonization or colonialism. Yeah. Um, and if they, um, if this is interpreted as such uh, by by the British and the French, for example, because mm -hmm. one of the main justifications of colonialism was precisely to uh, develop natural resources uh, in, in Africa. So I was just kind of, I just wanted to leave that with you. If that, oh, it's that comes great. up in the conversations at all, because clearly, you know, yes. the, the potential of African decolonization is already on the table. Then. I think you've hit a total nail on the head. I'm happy to keep reflecting on that briefly. People can go, I won't be offended. You, This is not a, a kind of you know captive audience, but um, the, the delicate way that the US and the State Department approach the arrival of international development activities in Africa is clear. So really only Liberia and Egypt were like in the 1950s key sites. And those, we can think of the specific reasons why those are safer spaces vis-a-vis um, -vis allies in the kind of European nations that are decolonizing and trying not to um, so that are being kicked out, right, justly for their intervention and interference and violent colonial administrations. Um, so it is a bit of a balancing act, but by the 1960s and 1970s, it's much more widespread. And you would see um, interior and Central African Republic and, you know, other places um, across the African continent. So, yes, ego among European allies who are confronted with a robust world-making project from African uh, nations. It's, uh, it's true that, that that geography is shifting over time in this period. Um, and I see I, I have great questions from Laura. I'm so sorry I didn't get a chance to address that. I'll just kind of briefly say I, I hear you about the actors category of progressive and that whether it's an administration that claims a democratic or Republican and whatever kind of agenda, 
the assumption of, you know, the entitlement to native land is, is completely consistent um, and, and something that affects things as does, um, and there are multiple transnationalisms that are very important to pan-tribal activism in this period. And your point about IITC is really well taken as a, a, something that does work that is not necessarily using like um, raw material extraction as the solution or path forward, but instead centering land rights and um, and the kind of um, and a hemispheric project and, and all kinds of other ways of mapping um, ties to the world. So those are those are really, I mean, there's more. I'm trying to catch up on everything in this chat, but I really just appreciate the the careful engagement with these ideas and the really um, helpful suggestions. Um, I'll be taking these to heart in this new project for sure. Thank you so much, uh, Megan, for, um, for everything. Really, this was this was a fascinating discussion, and I think it could have gone on another hour if we had if we had really some more time for it. Um, <laughs> yes, it was yes, really interesting, and it got me thinking about a lot of things. And uh, um, and I, I can see in the chat that it got uh, other people thinking about uh, a lot of things as well. So, um, yeah. thanks so much. I, I